Good evening to everyone and welcome back to the uh, Conceptual Basis of Urology course. And uh, today we have uh, selected a topic which is of great practical significance. All of you are involved in some form of uh, kidney stone management by percutaneous surgery. And there are always questions and there are questions about Imaging. Imaging, we know in urology is the cornerstone for diagnosis. But in relation to PCNL, there are certain specific considerations. This includes both uh, for preoperative staging and evaluation by imaging, and also uh, in the perioperative phase and for, look for looking for complications and the stone clearance. So the questions about which imaging, and we have uh, as, as a classical Urologists, we used to do a lot of intravenous urography. This is mostly replaced by uh, CT scan now. Uh, the, the use of CT scan has opened, ushered into a new era. However, there are issues related to radiation. In order to address all these questions, we have requested a very dear friend and a colleague and one of the finest proponent of this procedure in our region, uh, Dr. S.K. Pal, who has always been very supportive of all our academic activities. And I don't think there could be any, anyone better than uh, Dr. Pal to talk about uh, this issue with his vast uh, clinical experience in this area. So over to you, Dr. Pal, and thank you very much for being here this evening. I'll stop sharing. Very good evening, and, uh, everyone. Very good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen. Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Yes. Loud and clear. And my first slide is on. Can you see that? Uh, we can see the slide show, but uh, not the full screen. Is it? So maybe uh, if you can go into the slide show. No. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Now my first slide is on, isn't it? Yes. So respected senior members in this August audience, dear friends and colleagues, at the outset, I would like to put on record my sincere thanks to Professor Hamad Athar, who is a good friend and we have been meeting in the conferences and who has invited me to participate in this conceptual basic course. I am really amazed to see his enthusiasm of conceptualizing this particular basic course where he invites people from all over the world and then they participate in this teaching program. I am thankful to Pakistan Association of Urological Surgeons Karachi uh, chapter and I have many friends in Pakistan. I have visited Pakistan five times and the most thrilling experience was crossing Atari Vaga border on foot and taking breakfast, authentic breakfast in the Lahore, in the city of Lahore. My last visit was in 2017 when I went to Benazir Bhutto Hospital on the invitation of Professor Mumtaz and participated in the operative workshop. So thank you very much for inviting me once again amongst dear friends from Pakistan. And we will be discussing today, which is the most commonly asked question during any discussion going on in the PCNL workshops. 
which is the choice of most appropriate imaging modality for preoperative planning and postoperative complications of PCNL. I have no conflict of interest. See, PCNL is a precise surgical technique and therefore, before we undertake PCNL, we have to have a precise information as to what is happening where we are going and where we are going to strike. So we should know the exact number and size of calculi in the pelvic elicial system. We should know the site, size, location and rotation of the kidneys. We should have the exact location of calculi within the pelvic elicial system. Exact anatomical details of pelvic elicial system like we should know the width, angulations and alignment of calluses and infundibuli. We should also know the surrounding areas from where we are going to take entry into the kidneys, that is the lower ribs and iliac crest. We should know the adjoining organs where they are and how much they can be coming on the way. So all these things should be known by pre-operative imaging to be hitting it precisely. And unfortunately, no single imaging modality gives all these informations in one go. So let us see the limitations and advantages and adv disadvantages of different tech, uh, imaging modalities. Ultrasound, if we talk about ultrasound, we all know by our clinical experience that if we get a ultrasound done, of the same patient by the same doctor on the same machine four times in a day, you will get four different reports. Particularly the sizes of stones in the ultrasound, they are so variable that the four millimeter stone in eco can be taken as 10 millimeter stone and it makes hell of a difference as far as the management is concerned. So accuracy of ultrasound and sensitivity of ultrasound was studied and this paper had clearly shown for the right sided kidney stones the sensitivity of ultrasound is only 52 to 57 percent and on the left side the sensitivity decreases further because the left kidney is more compact there is a dromedary hump and then there is some difficulties in identifying and sensitivity goes down as far as ureteric stones are con concerned, ultrasound is very poor in identifying the ureteric stones and only 57.3% sensitivity is there. So obviously when the ultrasound is so poor in detecting accurately the stones in the pelvic elicial system, their number, location, sizes, it is not possible to take ultrasonographic pictures in uh, when you are actually planning for the PCNL. But yes, ultrasound is useful when you are planning initial puncture. The advantages of ultrasound in the planning, in the uh, executing phase is when it shows adjacent solid, solid organs. You can see the pleural space. You can identify the colon. It visualizes the bloated calluses in kidney as hypoechoic targets so you can identify and make the target you can hit the target and it can even show the course of advancing needle towards the target calyx but it has got some disadvantages also when you are using only ultrasound many times it will not show the infundibulum particularly in undilated cases and its alignment with the calyx it is difficult to see the progress of guide wire in pelvic elicial system. So you will be only seeing the bloated up calyx, but you will not know whether we have to enter this calyx in this direction or in this direction. That is the disadvantage of ultrasound. Sometimes you can see if you are lucky, you can see in a nicely bloated up uh, kidney, but usually our patients are dehydrated and not most of our patients have got hugely dilated systems when we are going to do PCNL. When you are holding the ultrasound probe in your left hand and trying to puncture with the right hand, we are not so familiar and so uh, experienced with ultrasound. 
most often you will be seeing in an ultrasound image like this now if you put the you want to see the stone the stone will be seen like this as a eco ecogenic area if you ask your assistant to go on filling the calyces you go on filling the pelvic calicial system you may start seeing some of the calyces bloated up and when the needle starts coming from this area and when you are moving the needle to and fro again and again you can identify the approaching needle but it is not as clear as you see in fluoroscopic image so you have to be really familiar with the ultrasound then you can puncture the calyx and once you are puncturing the calyx and if it was a undilated and you had not seen the infundibulum you might puncture this bloated up calyx in this direction in this direction or in this direction in any way you will enter that particular calyx if you are using a terumo guide wire which is the most uh, commonly used guide wire hydrophilic it will come through this needle hits the target here this and then nicely it will go inside and in two dimensional image of fluoroscopy you will feel that the guide wire has gone in smoothly but it is at the 90 degree angle you will be making a track in this direction so once you have punctured most of the operators once they get the fluid they switch over to the a fluoroscopic image and then they tend to accept the puncture in spite of some misalignment so you have in under ultrasound guidance you have punctured like here this at a right angle and now you have to remove this stone so what you will do in the process of passing a nephroscope you will try to tilt and come inside and the kidney this area cannot be moved so the kidney will be lifted up because kidney is the mobile organ and when you are going to come through this particular implant sheath inside and going in this direction there may happen some tear here some tear over here and it may cause bleeding so a proper pcnl proper puncture should be in nice alignment with the infundibulum you should see the infundibulum come in the same straight line so that there is no tearing in the renal parenchyma and comfortably you can reach up to this stone yes ultrasound is very useful in detecting hepatosplenomegaly that is what as soon as i get the report of ultrasound because most of the patients who come for surgery they will be bringing the first report as a ultrasound report and i will not concentrate on to the stone size location and all i will see is there any hepatosplenomegaly in ultrasound report i will give respect to any degree of hydrouretral nephrosis or even the hydrocalicosis it will guide me only during initial puncture otherwise ultrasound will not be useful in the planning phase coming to the next imaging modality which is being most commonly used these days is computed tomography we often ask for nccti kub or we ask for a ct urography if the urea creatinine is normal renal parameters are normal we are usually asking for the ct urography and a unenhanced helical ct is highly sensitive more than 95% it is only because it is taking the cuts of the kidney usual cuts are between 5 mm to 8 mm distance if unfortunately a stone is less than 3 mm or less than 4 mm and it comes in between these cuts you may miss that particular stone otherwise a nccct uh, kub ct scan shows all the calculi of all the sizes and more than 95% of the times you are able to identify this stone now we have got multi detector ct dual energy ct there are new re, uh, reconstruction algorithms are available so they do a 3d reconstruction and nice images are provided with the ct urography also ct honsfield units can even tell you how dense the stone is going to be hard how hard the stone will be and whether you will require laser or pneumatic or both together for breaking that stone 
so so much additional information also you can get through ct now let us study the ct when we get for plain and for our a stone case either we get dynamic video films or we get set of sequential images in coronal plane sagittal plane and transverse plane this is the transverse plane here when you cut the body antero posteriorly this is called coronal plane and this is the sagittal plane when you cut the body right to left or we get 3d reconstructed images see this is what usually we get there is a video and you have to be really careful in studying the running video and then try to memorize this particular image of this stone how when the kidney is being cut down 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 how the stone is spread inside the pelvic ischial system all that you have to study and memorize this is not the static image which we got in this particular case we are seeing the video and trying to memorize and then during the surgery also if there is any doubt you will have to come to the video once again but anyway these videos give you so much information about the surrounding organs see this is the ureteric stone which has come out anteriorly when you go to the posterior cuts you can see the stone in the lower calyx and so on all those things can be identified 3d reconstructed images they show it all they can show the ribs the relationship of the ribs with the pelvic ischial system they can also show the stones exact location of the stone in the superior calyx in the renal pelvis in this particular calyx in this particular calyx 3d images they show you everything but still there is some problem with the ct which i am going to discuss further so ct shows us exact number and location of calculi it shows us the details of the kidneys it also shows us the window for the pcn tract we will be discussing it nicely it shows us the location of colon you can measure the difference between the skin to the calyx which you are going to puncture you know how much depth you will be going in and depth of the target calyx can be pointed out on the patient's body see this is how you are going to get the ct and if you see you can see the site number of stones inside and exactly you know exactly you know when from the lower this is the upper uh, this is the middle kidney this is a little lower down little lower down and when you approach the lower calyx at that time there will be so many stones there are four stones which can be seen all the details of the stone can very well be seen in this ct this area which was very difficult and used to be called we used to be call it as a graveyard because at earlier days we were only doing x ray kubs and the sacroiliac joint this area we were not able to identify the stones because sacroiliac joint is a white area and white over the white cannot be seen but now with the ct you can nicely see the middle ureteric stone so ct shows all the stones and particularly if the stone is not very dense like this 480 hounsfield unit stones if you compare x ray with the ct you can very well see how much more the ct has shown this is a case where the complication had taken place avulsion has taken place and this case was referred to me later on you can even identify one stone fragment has gone out of the system and lying outside so so much information you can get by ct which you are not getting through the x rays you can also see the extension of the stone into the anterior calyx into the posterior calyx all this information can very well be obtained by the ct ct also shows finer details of the kidneys now this cyst would not have been seen in x ray neither in in our image intensifier when we are doing the puncture but if you approach this kidney posteriorly you will enter the cyst you will realize your some fluid has come you will feel that you are into the collecting system but actually you will be entering this cyst so all this will be known by the ct itself this is another cyst on the right kidney so you can identify that uh, you can identify the details of the kidney very well 
you can see when there is a stone in this particular kidney coming down 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 when you are cutting this section down 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 when you come to the lower pole you can identify the isthmus and this is a horseshoe kidney and the stone is extending only up to the calyx and not in the in isthmus all this information can be obtained by a good ct scan ct shows window for the pcn track <clears throat> we should learn how to study the ct and here i would like my junior colleagues to be little more attentive and be with me to understand how to read the ct see it's first of all we see the coronal sections and try to identify the region where the stone is whether it is in the lower calyx or in all the calyces where we have to approach now you should study the transfer sections concentrate on this transfer section means we are cutting the kidney and seeing the kidney from below this is the left side and this is the right side in the upper five pictures you can only see a large liver and a large spleen when you come down to the sixth film now you start seeing the upper pole of the left kidney come a little more down this is another portion of the left kidney this is still the upper pole this is the left kidney and now you have started seeing the upper pole of the right kidney also come little more lower down and if you see if you start counting 1 2 3 4 5 then in next 5 and in next 5 in these 15 cuts you are seeing the left kidney you are able to identify the left kidney you have to concentrate only on the left kidney at this time this is a case of emphysematous pyelonephritis where we have to make the puncture so here in 15 cuts the left kidney is over from first cut to 15 cuts now this kidney is 12 cm long 120 mm long seen in 15 cuts so every cut is at 8 mm length am i clear on that point every 8 mm there is one cut and 1 2 3 4 & 5 in these five cuts you can see the spleen on the lateral aspect of this particular kidney so if you are doing a supine puncture in this particular case you cannot come from the lateral aspect here if you make a puncture here in the upper pole of the kidney first five cuts means upper 4 cm of the kidney every cut is 8 mm five cuts means upper 4 cm if you are puncturing the upper pole of the kidney you cannot come laterally and you will be coming only through this area from behind if the patient is prone you can take from midline up to this particular area you can puncture from here but you cannot puncture from this aspect so this particular film has shown in the upper pole if i have to approach i have to approach here but as you come to the middle pole of the kidney now there is no spleen seen and the window is opened up now you can see you can puncture the kidney from so much of area from the back so from this much of area similarly on the right side you can see in the first five cuts there is liver on the it is almost encircling the kidney from sixth cut also there is uh, liver is seen seventh also the liver is seen from eighth cut now the liver is remaining up and the kidney is now the lower pole and the middle pole of the right kidney can also be approached from the right side so like this you have to study from which particular area you can enter the kidney now you study this coronal sections this is from anterior to posterior the cuts are coming from anterior to posterior so in the initial cuts you will be seeing only the intestines and there is no vertebral column seen it is only here for the first time you are seeing the body of l4 and l5 and then when you go little posterior you start seeing the whole vertebral column and the kidneys also lit up and then you can identify the presence of 
liver and spleen so like this you have to study these films entero posteriorly in coronal sections and transversely and identify your track from where you are going to take entry into the kidney then you have to identify when you see ct films have been given you have to identify where the colon is there see the colon is surrounding lower poles of the kidney anteriorly definitely hepatic flexure and splenic flexure is there but at times this goes lateral or even posterior lateral to the, posterior to the kidney and you have to be really careful so for this again you have to study these films in relation to the kidney in relation to the colon now if you try to identify this particular upper pole of the left kidney this is the upper pole of the left kidney one two three films the left kidney is seen and you see the shadow of the colon is far away as you come down as you come down this is the shadow of the colon which you can identify in the ncct itself as you come approach near the lower pole now this is the colonic gas shadow and this is the colonic gas shadow this is the colonic gas shadow at the lower pole where there are some stones this is the colonic gas shadow so colon is not coming posterior or even lateral to the kidney so you are safe you can see the position of the colon when you are seeing the coronal sections when you come anteriorly in relation to the kidney in the left kidney this is the colon this is the same case you go little posterior 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 and you see the colon is still there still there still there still there and here the colon is finishing off and in the next film there is hardly any colon seen and so much of kidney is seen so posterior to the colon posterior to the kidney there is no colon if you feel that the colon is posterior to the kidney you should dry you should draw a line at the lower pole and see if this is a retro renal colon you have to be careful during your pcnl now there is one hitch to it when you are doing a ncct kub or you are doing a ct urography the patient is there in only for 5 minutes and if it is a non contrast ct scan he is getting only a 10 seconds exposure at that time after that he comes out of the table he goes to the injection room contrast is injected after 15 minutes the patient is brought to the table again and another exposure is made that is also just for 10 seconds so you are seeing only two images of the colon only those 10 seconds during ncct kub and during ct urogram twice you have seen where the colon is but when you are going to do pcnl maybe after 2 to 3 days most likely in prone position these cts have been obtained in supine position after 2 to 3 days you are not sure that the colon will remain there or not because colon is a mobile organ and keeps changing its position so you have taken only two exposures of where the colon was there in those 10 seconds each that's all information you have now coming to the ct study how to see the skin to calyx distance once you have made up your mind that you will be puncturing this posterior calyx or anterior calyx and you have made up your mind that you will be taking the patient in prone pcnl or supine pcnl because most of us do prone pcnl i have taken this picture you take this picture and put the patient this picture in the prone position now in prone position if you have tried to you have planned to puncture the anterior calyx from back to the front when the patient is lying down in front of you like this the usual thickness of the average person is from back to the front on the side is either 9 inches to 12 inches now this is the place 9 inches to 12 inches and you have identified this is the area which is somewhere around 3 inches below if you divide it into three parts 
and a patient is only 9 inches thick. So it is one third where the calyx will be there. So you can mark that from the back three inches down. Here if I go straight inside, I will be reaching to the calyx which I want to puncture. So you can even mark. Also you can see how much fat is there. What is the distance from skin up to the calyx? Even you can calculate and then you can plan in this CT. Now this is a thick female, female patient where there is so much of fat and you see it is almost in the center if I have to punch up this particular calyx and if the patient is 12 inches thick, I know at the 6 inches from the back, this will be area where there will be calyx and then I will plan, this is a male patient where they there is hardly any fat in below the skin and there is a small distance and the kidney is quite posterior so I will be making a short, I will be traveling less distance. So you can make up your plan. You know this calyx will be this much of depth, maybe in the upper third, middle third or maybe somewhere half of the patient's body from the back. So you know how much needle depth will go in. How much angulation will be there? If it is a deep down, you will be able to, you will have to increase your angle and go in. So all this information and preoperative planning can be done by the CT films. Now coming to the role of X-ray KUB and intravenous urography, which we have been very familiar with. The best advantage of preoperative IVU with at least one prone film which is usually the 20-30 minutes film this is exactly what you are going to see on table because we are going to do a two-dimensional image we are going to do PCNL under a two-dimensional image of image intensifier on the x-ray table so this image is already made available to you preoperatively particularly in IVU series it gives you most comprehensive view of rib cage like if this case is there kyphoscoliotic or any other page you can identify in a plain x-ray or in IVO films what is the distance how much space you are going to get to take entry into the kidney so this is available in x-rays and in IVO series the space can be identified you can identify the cup of the calyx from where you will take the entry in one frame only, you can have the length and width of infundibuli in entirety. Not that different calyces, different depth, you will get the different uh, image. Alignment of direction of infundibuli can be obtained in IVU. Possibility of access from one calyx to other, you can see in one particular film. Alignment with PUJ and upper ureter can be identified in IVU films. And possible movement of colon over 90 to 120 minutes because this is the time taken when we are doing the IVP. These two films of IVP series, they have shown me this particular stone has moved down with deep inspiration between 11th and 12th rib. And this can very well be approached lateral to the mid scapular line between the 11th and 12th rib either direct end on puncture or by this side. So these two films in IVU have clearly shown me the track how I am going to take in. And as we know that when we are doing the supracostal punctures, we have to remain lateral to the mid scapular line, particularly when we are puncturing between the 10th and 11th rib or between 11th and 12th rib. So all this can be identified by two films of IVU and your planning is complete. This so much essential information about length, width and mutual angulation of infundibuli is readily available in IVU in supine and prone postures. This is the prone film, this is the supine film and you know that this is the stone and these are the infundibuli here. This probably is in a calicial diverticulum and I will make entry from here and this all full pelvic initial system nicely lit up in IVU has given you the direction how you are going to go. 
one advantage one example this is the stone lying here and to approach this stone you have only two calyces this long thin calyx and in fundibulum this also this is so much of information is available in ivo films in one plane if you study the ct of this case you will be seeing this particular calyx in multiple transverse sections because this is not in one plane this is going a little bit of anterior posteriorly also so here you have already known that this is a long thin infundibuli and if you use ultra mini pcnl without injuring the infundibuli and vessels around the infundibuli you will be able to reach to this stone so pre operative planning is complete because you have chosen the uh, the uh, technique also which you are going to use by seeing the ivo films in ivo the good advantage is you are taking films at different intervals we are not just uh, putting the patient on the uh, x ray table for one and a half hour our patient gets the dye injected after 15 minutes he comes back and lies down on the table we get one x ray then he moves away he is moving around after 30 minutes or 45 minutes he comes again so if you see one ivu series have you seen the distance of this particular stone in this film the distance has increased what does it mean there is a huge space over here the upper calyx is hugely dilated because it is not visualized in ivu but still we know that there is so much of distance available and if i puncture from here i'll be able to come in this direction so the movement of stone over a period can be identified and you can take the decisions accordingly ivu series has clearly shown these stones this stone is here in a hugely dilated system then this stone is particularly here some stones are in this calyx some stones are in this calyx everything is well known in ivu series ivu also shows these are the two stones which you have to remove one is in the lower calyx so obviously you have to remove this stone and you have to go via this direction only so that on the way you take out this stone and then proceed forward towards the calyx towards the pelvic stone this is a thick female patient you can identify the tubal rings you can identify huge tummy and you can also identify that this particular calyx which we are planning to puncture is almost parallel to the ureter so i will be making a entry quite medially if i want to enter this calyx and this thick female might have big buttocks also and if i enter from here the buttocks will come on my way in a prone position this is the prone film so buttocks will come on my way and therefore it will be better if the under maneuverability of my nephroscope will be uh, jeopardized so then i will try to identify if i want to puncture from here the stone in this calyx will not be will not be able to remove because it will be angulated here i will have to push this stone in front with the saline push this will be the most ideal calyx because it is infracostal as well as has a wide infundibulum it will reach up to the renal pelvis the buttocks will not come on my way and i will be little angulation and i will be able to enter this huge dilated calyx also so all this information i got by two ivu films and you can identify the prone film this is the ap film where you can see a nicely wide pelvis true pelvis of the patient and when the same patient is turned prone you will identify the shape of the pelvis changes the sacrum goes down and you can see how the iliac crest they becomes medially rotated so whether it is mentioned on the films or not you identify this is the prone film and in prone film if the ureter and the lower calyx they are parallel to each other your puncture has to be very medial to gain entry in with this in this infundibulum in alignment all this information can be obtained also you know that you will be able to puncture if you have the ivu films you will know if i enter from the lower calyx 
wide in fundibulum i will be able to enter the superior calyx also there will be some pelvic calicial system where this will be angulated here and you will know that you cannot enter so all this information can be obtained about the uh, kidney pelvic calicial system just with this good study of ivus now coming to colon how it is seen in the ivu films in ivu series as i had discussed we take 5 to 6 x rays over 1 to 2 hours and if you have an i if you don't concentrate only on the stone when you are seeing a ivu you can even see the whole length of the colon so when you are seeing a series of 5 to 6 x rays put together you catch up various possible locations and movements of the colon over a period of time in supine and prone position this will be more representative what you are going to get on table one example in an ivu series note if the pattern of colonic gas shadows is persistent in all the films in relation to the ipsilateral kidney or keeps changing its position especially in these cases where the colonic injury is more common so what you will do you will put all the films together and now you see the position of the colonic gas shadow in this film in this film the colonic gas shadow has changed and in the prone film whole of the colon is gone down there is no colonic gas shadow around the kidney we are very safe it is a mobile colon so no problem over these three x rays over a period of 1 hour or maybe 45 minutes we know the colon is changing its position in this x ray when you are studying the ivu you study the colon colon remains fixed in all the films in relation to the lower pole of the colon kidney so you have to be really careful when you are making a puncture another case when the colon remains fixed always in all the films over a period of 1 and 1/2 to 2 hours in relation to the lower pole of the kidney so you have to be really careful in these cases so taking all these points into consideration the final suggestion for pre for optimum pre operative imaging will be we should take advantage of all the technologies available if the finances are not the issue we and the uh, renal parameters are within normal limits you must go for a ct urography but when the patient finishes ct urography in 15 minutes or 20 minutes after contrast before he is leaving the x ray department take at least two to three films of x rays in prone and supine position that will be true representative of ivu and it will give you some additional information what you get through x rays and through ivp films another option is to go for ncct kub with ivu and ultrasound can only be used for initial puncture also ivu films particularly will help you in prone position to contribute quite significantly in planning because this is how you are going to see patient on table performing ct urography both in supine and prone if you ask this will increase the radiation dose and if you have to economize then you can do iv alone or ncct kub alone as we were doing all the pcnls in under iv only we were not using ct and ct sometimes we have to do those cases where the renal parameters are deranged we are left with only ncct and nothing else now coming to the imaging modality for post operative phase so in post operative stasis what you want to know you want to know if there are any residual calculi you want to know if there is any significant collections outside kidney like urinoma pleural collection ascites if there is any intra renal or perinephric hematoma any solid organ injury if you are suspecting or any bowel injury and spillage you want to see so different technologies are helpful for different things ultrasound imaging should be avoided particularly for residual fragments because the clots 
air in pelvic initial system, tip of nephrostomy tube, double J stents, matrix, pus flex, everything will be ecogenic and it may get reported as residual fragments and it will increase the anxiety of both patient as well as surgeon. So residual fragments less than 4 millimeter anyway, you will not be doing a redo uh, PCNL. You will have to wait and watch. So by this information by ultrasound, you are not going to gain anything. Then you will not do any immediate clinical decision and you will be waiting for three months. As we do in RIRS, we wait for three months before all the fragments are passed out. But if you have to see for the residual stones, I will advise to get a X-ray KUB done. X-ray will at least show you some significant stones if there are some residual fragments. And you may take a decision depending upon whether you need to remove these stones or not. Or if it is really necessary, you should go for X-ray or NCCT KUB, not for the ultrasound for residual stones. For urinoma, pleural collection and ascites, it is best assessed and followed up by ultrasound. The collections are nicely seen by this. But any hematoma, perinephric hematoma, any solid organ injury or bowel injuries are better seen by CT scan. For perinephric hematomas, if you want to see perinephric hematomas, well and good. 202 patients were studied with CT within five days in this particular study, five days of PCNL and hematomas were graded zero grade zero was then there was no hematoma that happened in 69 percent of cases and significant hematomas were seen grade three and four only in 3.5 percent of cases the re result was the perinephric hematomas in nearly one third of patients undergoing percutaneous nephrolithotomies whether you do a tubeless or a nephrostomy with nephrostomy tube there is no difference about the perinephric hematoma. But at the same time, none of the patients in this series, they required any surgical or percutaneous intervention for hematomas. So it is just the information you got. But in our setup, when the infective complications are quite often more common, uh, I had to do three cases of perinephric hematomas, which got infected and there was continuous pus discharge from the wound. So I had to do evacuation of the perinephric hematomas, particularly three cases. Now, how to drain the evacuate the perinephric or infected hematoma? Patient has undergone PCNL. There is hardly one small cut on the skin. And now there is a perinephric hematoma, which is causing some pus discharge and some problems, and you want to remove it. How will you remove it? Are you going to do a cut open, open surgery for removing everything? Or you are going to make a puncture in the perinephric hematoma and try to evacuate. If you make a puncture in the hematoma and pass the nephroscope from here and try to evacuate, it becomes very difficult. It won't come in. It won't get sucked up. It is an organized clot, some pus flakes also. So what I devised was put two sheets in the hematoma from one you inject the saline with one nephroscope in a hard way and through the other you try to aspirate when you do like this perinephric hematomas can very well be removed and you can see how nicely the perinephric hematoma could be removed and now there is perinephric in this perinephric space there is no hematoma left so for perinephric hematomas, you should do a CT study. So you know in relation to the kidney where the hematoma is near the upper pole, middle pole or lower pole, anterior to the kidney or posterior to the kidney. And then depending upon that, you make two tracks in the perinephric hematoma and you can remove. All this hematoma was removed. Now, is there a role of PC, this, uh, NCCT after PCNL in every case? This is a nice study where 190 is a multi-center study done in India. 197 patients underwent CT scan within 24 hours of PCNL. And surprisingly, thoracic complications were reported in 58.4% of cases. In the form of maybe some atelectasis, some collapse, some little bit of sympathetic effusion and all. 
Perinephric hematomas were reported in 8% of the cases, but none of them required any intervention and therefore the conclusion was CT scan, a routine CT scan post-operatively in PCNL is not going to be of real clinical significance in majority of cases. So just have patience, wait and watch. Some rare cases like this, there is a pleural effusion post-operatively, post-PCNL. But one patient, he came after one month. For one month after PCNL, he was all right. And now he has come with so much of effusion. You don't know whether this is urine or this is a tuberculosis empyema, what it is. The biochemistry also did not help me much. Now, how to identify whether this is urine in the chest or there is a pus or hematoma or there is uh, tuberculosis. So in such situations, DTPA scan will help you. If the DTPA lets up this particular area, this is urine and nothing else. So the isotope scan has shown that this is urine in the chest and there is some communication between the left kidney and the chest and then it had to be drained. So rarely you will have to use DTPA scan to identify any collection, whether it is urine or not. Thank you very much for giving me so much of time and for your patience. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paul. It's a wonderful presentation, testament to your vast clinical experience. Uh, and you have very clearly described clinical situation and how to make those important clinical decisions. Uh, there are some questions and I think I will not hold you back for too long, but uh, maybe a couple of questions. Number one is about the retrorenal colon. So if you do identify that there is a retrorenal colon, uh, what is your approach? Uh, would, you, would you not do PCNL in these situations? Would you use ultrasound or how do you go about it? Sir, as I mentioned that uh, retrorenal colon, if it was identified in the CT scan, that particular 10 seconds the colon was there. I will be only careful. I may use a ultrasound just before doing a puncture to see whether the colon is still there. Secondly, most appropriate because even the colonic perforations have taken place when the ultrasound was used. I know the case where it was used and still the colonic injury took place. And we could not identify the colon by ultrasound. The most appropriate will be when you are puncturing, when you are making the puncture and your needle is going in. At that time, continuously keep an eye on the colonic gas shadow and whether your needle is touching that gas shadow or indenting that gas shadow or whether that gas shadow is moving equally when you are moving the needle to and fro. If you feel that the needle is hitting that gas shadow, colonic, you will be able to see colonic gas shadow in every case. Only you have to have an eye. Don't concentrate only on the infant, on the calyx and try to go there. When your needle is going in, on the way you must watch how the colonic gas shadow that is behaving with the approaching needle. If it starts moving, remove your needle, then go a little more medial. The colon will not come most of the cases exactly posteriorly. It may be on the posterior lateral aspect. So go a little more medial, make another puncture. If you have made one puncture in the uh, colon by needle, initial puncture needle, doesn't matter. It is not like a gallbladder where if you puncture a gallbladder during PCNL, you have to do a cholecystectomy. That anyway, so many papers are there. If you have aspirated, particularly right side, if you have aspirated uh, uh, this uh, bile, then immediately after PCNL, you should do a cholecystectomy. But in colon, nothing like that. If you have punctured the knee with needle, you remove the needle, go a little more medial, and go again. So both the advantage, colon, uh, when for you, you, you can use uh, ultrasound as well as keep an eye on the colon when the needle is going in. Right, thank you. And uh, I know that uh, you are really very good with fluoroscopic punctures and you use fluoroscopy to the best of your advantage. Um, there's a question about um, the planning CT. 
and you have also alluded to in in your presentation about uh, most of us doing prone PCNLs. CTs are invariably done in a in a supine position. So, uh, is there any specific situation where would you like your CT to be in a in a prone position in any clinical situation? or complex stone situation or surrounding organ situation? Particularly surrounding organ situation, uh, the prone film will be uh, better. If uh, uh, your CT colleague tells you in supine position, the colon is uh, coming on the way. It is a retrorenal colon. So immediately ask for a prone CT because then you can compare when the patient is turned prone how the colon moves, it will invariably, it will be moving more laterally and more posteriorly when the patient is turned prone. Otherwise, uh, I would like if they, uh, I have asked my uh, radiologist people to um, reduce the dosage, but give a prone film in all the cases if possible. So they have mentioned that in certain, they will reduce the area under uh, which they have to study. Maybe you can tell only the middle and lower pole because upper pole hardly any time the colon will come posterior to that. Middle and lower pole area, maybe eight segments in prone film. So they will reduce the dosage so that the patient doesn't get exposed too much. Otherwise, if uh, possible, it is always better to have both the views, supine as well as prone CT. And uh, so if, if you're dealing with predominantly radiolucent stones uh, and you want to cut down radiation or cost issues and don't do a CT, do you ever do ultrasounds uh, or you delay ultrasounds for maybe a month or so so that you get a real picture of how much of residual stones are there? Residual stones, uh, post op post PCNL, post op post PCNL uh, for radiolucent yeah. stones. Yeah. So if you're not doing a CT, uh, would you still consider doing an ultrasound maybe a little later after PCNL, not very early phase? It is better to do CT after three months, at least between two CTs. If preoperatively you have done CT, I would not recommend that you should get a CT within three, four days or within seven days. After three months gap, then you should do a CT. You can go ahead with the CT. Okay. If you feel that residual stones are remaining behind, wait at least for three months. After three months, do it again. Great. Uh, thank you very much. There are some questions about uh, the uh, puncture techniques. And I know that uh, there are some nice videos that you have also uploaded on the YouTube about both the triangulation technique uh, and the bullseye technique and they are available on, on internet. So for those uh, who have asked these questions, please refer to, because uh, I think we're short on time. So Dr. Paul, thank you very much uh, for being with us uh, this evening. And I'm really grateful for giving us uh, time from your very busy schedule. So have a very good weekend uh, and good night. Thank you, sir. I have written a chapter in the book uh, on uh, this fluoroscopic guided access. So that is book is now available as a minimally invasive PCNL. It has been edited by uh, Madhusudan Agrawal. He is from uh, Agra and from uh, and Bhaskar Somani from UK, Southampton and Dilip Mishra. So this book is, uh, I have written about 57 or 58 pages only on fluoroscopic guided access with so many pictures. So all these points which I have mentioned and are available in video are also written in that. So you can, uh, if you can see that, you can find that book. It is from Springer. So that chapter I hope will be helpful to all my young young colleagues. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you very much, Thank sir. You. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you, Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night.